specify exactly what sort of computer you would have to be accessing. So from the outset, we were dealing with really a financial institution's computer or a government computer. Those were sort of there at the beginning. As time went on, and there was an amendment where there would be a protected computer. Ah, oh, protected computer. Yes, Jen? <laughs> well, just out of interest, like what, you know, since sort of, you know, the, the Casio calculator of 1988, what is not a protected computer these days? Right. Just out of interest. So fair point, um, which is that protected computer is in fact a very, very broad term. So as I mentioned, when the statute was first passed, uh, it was focused on sort of government computers, national security information. It was intended to protect a federal interest. So a federal interest computer, in fact, was the term that was in the statute. And that made sense. In 1984, or 1986, depending on which timeline you use, uh, by and large, the government was one of the principal victims of a computer crime. So the federal interest was narrowly defined. Moving from 1984, we had 8% of, of computers in, in households to now, where we have somewhere bordering on 90%, essentially. And, um, a protected computer, the class has expanded. And to your point, yes, essentially, by the definition, essentially anything that's connected to the internet would constitute a protected computer under the statute. OK, well, I, since that's super broad, I hope that the rest of the statute's not super broad as well. Moving along. Hard to understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you also have to obtain information from the computer that you have accessed. Uh, what, sorry, I, uh, yeah, sorry. What, is, what does obtaining information mean? There you go, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody could hold up cue cards, okay. that would be great. <laughs> so obtaining a, a, a information, um, does it mean that you must download and copy and take away? No, uh, merely viewing the information on the screen would be enough to be obtaining information. If you saw the directory structure of a remote computer, that under the CFA would be obtaining information under the statute. And so now we come really to the nub of the issue. Um, this is really where what is considered the malicious activity is kind of defined and captured. It is that all of that must happen without authorization or while exceeding authorized access. How do we normally look at this term? So for us, in the lion's share of our cases, involve people with malicious intent. What do I mean? By and large, most of our, our cases involve people who are breaking into computers to monetize that information and sell it either on the black market or to extort people, number of extortion cases, um, people who clearly have malicious intent in breaking into a computer. Or in the alternative, we have a number of cases, and these are actually our favorites because they're the easiest. Um, there's the mad sysadmin who walks out the door and with a firm middle finger tears down the system, right? Your, your, your universe of, of, of suspects is fairly narrow in that case. Um, and this happens with greater frequency than you may imagine. Can we, can we just have a momentary pause and a hand for Leonard, who created slides that include a guy with devil's horns and no hoodies and no baklavas anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> so what does this term mean, though? There's been a lot of, and I think most of the, the debate and most of the controversy of the statute is around what does this term mean without authorization or exceeding authorized access when you're dealing with something like what your community deals with. That is, when is it your interaction with a remote, conser remote server is in fact authorized? Now there is a definition under the statute for what it means to exceed authorized access. But many, upon reading it, still scratch their head and say, I don't feel like I have a better idea of what this actually means. Yeah, because here you go, you're defining exceeds authorized access without a definition of authorization. So if obtaining information is just seeing it, then what if a website owner accidentally exposes information? Why am I the one who has the liability as the person who goes to the website and sees that information? You don't have a definition of authorization. That's a lot of breadth. OK, so there is not a definition of authorization in the statute. That is true. There's been case law that kind of has tried to address this and give it greater form. To greater or less success, the one thing I would flag is this has been the subject of, of some disagreement in the courts. So the federal judicial system is divided into circuits. So you have your 11 circuits and you've got the DC circuit. Um, a, a circuit is essentially um, a cluster of courts. You have your district court, your trial court, where you go and you still make your case. If you lose there, you can appeal to the appellate court. The appellate court 
actually decides the law for the entire circuit. So you've got you know, 12 of these across the country. Um, in this instance, you have what we call a circuit split. That means is we have three circuits that have adopted a narrow interpretation of what exceeding authorized access means. And what these courts have said is, for example, let's take the Nozzle case. Oops. The Nozzle case. In the Nozzle case, what you had was an employee who leaves a, com a company looking to start up another company and make money. He uh, convinces his friends who are still at the company to log into the, the network, get data, and send it to him that would be used in, an, in the adverse interest to the company that, that he used to work for, which violated the employment agreement he had and he signed when he joined the company. He was prosecuted under the CFAA uh, under the theory that when the computer was accessed for that purpose and the information was subsequently used in this other way, that was contrary to the agreement. What the court said was you cannot use authorized access, like you, these people who actually had access to the system by agreement, to later on, <laughs> oh, you, you're, 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 I'm sorry, I have to call you because you are, you are please. Yes, what I'm wondering, okay, and I, I, Understand that someone leaves their company, they take proprietary information, they pass it over. Okay, I'm not American, as you can probably hear. I'm from Australia. In Australia, this also happens, and this is what civil courts are for. Why is this a crime? Okay. That's what I'm, I, I, I get that that's exceeding authorization, it's doing bad things, devil wants all of that. Right. Why on earth is that the government's? Is I think that's. You, you wanna... you, uh, well, so I think then I'll give you a quick answer, but I also think that'll get debated in the panel. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. That's, that's good. It's good. Right. So, I mean, this, is, this reminds me of a number of statutes that we actually have to deal with. For example, the IP statutes, intellectual property statutes, that, that have a civil remedy along with a criminal remedy. And when do you go which way? A large question may be, like, what is the actual damage? There's actually a rubric of, of considerations that we have when we decide whether to bring a federal case and whether it represents a, a substantial enough federal interest. By rules, we are supposed to compare the case to this rubric of, of considerations and decide whether it warrants a criminal uh, prosecution. In this case, we apparently did. And we decided that there was enough damage, uh, enough cost, that we would proceed with this as a criminal matter. Um, so that's the short answer to that. Okay. Sure. Um, but the courts, the appellate court eventually came back and said, that's not OK. Uh, you have turned what is a hacking statute into a misappropriation statute. The fact that this information was taken and used for another purpose wasn't a hacking crime in and of itself. You had two other circuits, the fourth and the second, who reached a similar decision, the, the second circuit cannibal cop case, um, where you had the police officer who was trolling the police databases to find potential victims to um, kidnap and uh, assault. Um, the government's theory there was when you were accessing that database police officer, you were not doing that consistent with your employment agreement, and therefore your access to it was a violation of law, of the CFAA. Second Circuit came back and said, just like in the Nozzle case, no, that's not the way it works, because this individual had legitimate access to the, the network, um, and you cannot turn that into unauthorized access because of a mere violation of the way that, that, that they chose to use the computer at the time. In contrast to this, you have three circuits that went the other way, though, that basically say the agreement can actually determine whether authorization is legitimate. So if an employer says, you know, you're allowed to use a computer for X, but not Y, if you are on the computer, you're using it for X, and then you use Y, that's enough to constitute a CFAA violation, kind of under the property law, being able to control that which is your property. To make this more complicated, there was a second Nozzle case. So the gentleman Nozzle who was acquitted because of the, uh, the reversal um, the first time around, the government re-prosecuted him under a different theory, under the CFAA. As opposed to saying he exceeded authorized access, the argument was he didn't have access to start off with because he had left the company and had his privileges revoked. And therefore, when he used other people to get access to that information, he essentially was doing so without authorization. And indeed, the appellate court said, you know what? That's an OK theory under the CFA. So you have a variety of different theories under which the CFA um, is proceeding in the criminal and the, in the civil lane. For you. <laughs> My heart. 
Um, okay, so um, we've talked about the fact that the lack of clarity around what authorization means has resulted in circuit splits and has made things um, somewhat more contentious and difficult. I'm going to talk about some of the additional uh, challenges that come out of this, additional criticisms. So the first is just um, the kinds of things that most people would think probably shouldn't be federal crimes could arguably get swept up in this. So for example, you're on match. And match's rules say that you're expected to represent yourself as you are. And yet my profile says that I'm tall, built, and stunning. You are. You are. <laughs> that is very sweet of you, but you're, you're undermining the point that I'm lying. Um, but thank you. Girl power. Um, okay, so should that be a federal crime? Should I, in fact, end up going to prison where I can use my match profile to attract an entirely different type of person? Um, or should it not? Um, another example would be that I sit at work all day checking my baseball scores, which Clearly I do all the time. Love baseball, mad for it. Um, again, like am I am I exceeding authorized access or accessing without authorization? Because work says, hey, guess what guys? When you're at work, you should be working and we really want you to use work computers for work. And checking your baseball scores isn't really work. Uh, should that be a federal crime? Should I go to prison? Probably not. Um, so this kind of highlights the fact that the gray area in exceeds authorization um, or in, sorry, in defining authorization can be pretty far reaching, can have some fairly foolish, Leonard is dying here. Leonard, have there ever been any prosecutions based on this of this kind? So uh, the answer to that is with one qualification, because I believe you're talking about the Lori Drew case. Um, which uh, no, we, I'm going to get to Lori. Okay, which we, we, we would say as an exception to this, no. This is not the type of case that we spend federal resources on. In fact, in the Nozzle case, the first Nozzle case, the dissent, that is the one judge who disagreed with the uh, opinion that was uh, pointed down, um, basically said, we're creating straw men here as a way of saying that the statute would not be used this way. And we would agree with that because this is not a case that we would prosecute. Which sounds very good and reasonable. And we do like the fact that DOJ is not wasting taxpayers' dollars on this kind of thing. However, the problem is that we have security researchers, and they look for bugs. And oftentimes, the work that they do falls into this morass of gray area, where it is unclear if they are accessing without authorization or exceeding authorized access. And for researchers, it's really hard to know what the line is. And I have this sort of like weirdly naive, old-fashioned view that I feel like if I'm covered by a law, I should be able to understand what the law means and like know how to toe the line. I may not like the line. I may feel like the line is in the wrong place. But it would be really good if there was a clear line and I could say, OK, I'm on the side of the line that's not going to put me in an orange jumpsuit. So this is the big problem for me, is this piece. Like This is the piece that gets me fired up about the CFAA, is that I feel like researchers, for those who can't see my t-shirt, Hackers Manifesto. I feel like researchers may be considered criminals, but mostly their crime is curiosity. And we need them. We rely on them. How many people in here do research, do security research? A whole bunch of people. Thank you, by the way. We really appreciate the work you do. I, as a consumer of technology, appreciate the work that you do. And this is a real problem, that it's not clear. So recently, when Len and I were going through the slides, I said to him, is internet scanning, port scanning, a violation of the CFA? And he said, in my lawyerly way, it depends. <laughs> so <laughs> so this, is, this is the problem of technology. And we, we, we deal with this every day. For example, I, part of my job is dealing with investigators who want to do an interesting investigative things. And in almost each of those cases, the question is, hey, can I actually go and search this computer using this tool? And the question is, the answer is, it depends. How are you going to do it? Where is the computer located? What exactly are you searching on the computer? There are a lot of questions that are pivot points that would change the legality of these things. And this isn't, I think, about just the statute. Those are surveillance laws. It's about technology. It's, it's, it's not a simple answer. So with port scanning, for example, um, by and large, if you are simply running a normal port scan, you're getting information about protocols, what software number, things of that sort from a remote computer, that would not be a CFAA violation. However, what's a harder question is, for example, if you were dealing with a heartbleed exploit, and what you decided to do was to craft packets to see what you were going to actually get back from a server 
and whether you're going to get kicked back the data that's not supposed to get kicked back in the Heartbleed um, exchange. That comes closer to the line. Um, and so this is why it, it, it depends on what you're doing. And I understand that this is difficult for people who work in technology, but I s would submit it's a problem that is inherent in technology, perhaps not in the statute itself. Um, I'm really glad that you opened the door for the Heartbleed example. Yes. Uh, so Heartbleed is a great example of this, because when Heartbleed came out, um, lots of people were told, hey, and when I say lots of people, I mean every internet user was told, hey, go change your password for any site you actually care about the information on. The problem was that if the site itself had not taken the necessary steps to protect itself from Heartbleed, all you would be doing is throwing new passwords into the void. Not helpful. So lots of nice people, we'll call them security researchers, said, hey, we'll, we've created this little free tool for you, and this enables you to test whether the site is still vulnerable to Heartbleed or not. For those who don't know, the words test whether the site is still vulnerable to Heartbleed equals exploit Heartbleed. Um, so all of those people who are, let's say, my mum, were happily <laughs> exploiting websites without knowing it, right? They didn't really think about it in those terms, but this is what they had to do to figure out whether the site was still vulnerable in order to then change their password and protect themselves. Now, granted, the FBI did not come crashing into my mum's living room. She's all good. Um, Nonetheless, the point remains that if you have a situation where the way that the law is written basically means that that action, which is so sort of like innocent and well-meaning and is do designed to promote better cybersecurity, which should be what this is all about, that kind of suggests that that law might be a little bit broken, a little bit. So on to my next points. Um, this, is, this is my biggie. So authorization and the lack of definition is a really big problem. The problem, though, is massively exacerbated by Section G of 1030. 1030 is the CFA. Um, so Section G basically says, uh, yeah, basically, if you violate any of this, is also cause for civil action. And that's a huge problem, because again, how many people in here do research? Hands up. OK, how many of you have received legal threats? How many of you have received criminal legal threats? Yeah, that's what I thought. How many of you have received civil legal, legal threats? So pretty much everybody who gets a threat, it comes because of Section G, which is civil action. And that's what creates the big chilling effect, right? Is people are worried that companies who are naturally protective of their reputation will use the CFAA as a big stick to fight off researchers. And I, pretty much every researcher that I know of at Rapid7 has had a threat at some point, and it's always come from civil cases. There's very few. There are a couple that have had criminal threats. Um, and this is, this is the big problem. This is what we all tell each other about. This is what stops people talking at conferences. This is what creates the big chilling effect. And not to muddy two different talks, but um, tomorrow we're going to be going through survey data from the NTIA disclosure process surveys. And 65%, um, uh, I think it was, of the researchers we surveyed said that they were very, very worried about legal threats. And that impacts the way that they think about, um, about disclosing. And they often don't disclose because of it. So, so to, to so Patrick's basically saying we have a, a bad we have a bad sort, uh, model, and so in terms of this, I think this is a way of us creating a graph to show you something. In terms of my sources, we surveyed the internet, um, which I have been mocked for many times. So have at it. Um, we've also done stuff like we polled the Metasploit community, um, all that kind of stuff. We consistently hear from people this response. Every time I've done a CFA talk, which is now a bunch of times, I always ask for a show of hands. And it's always the case that I get lots of people who've had civil threats and very few have had criminal Also, two quick, oh, sorry. This data is consistent with my practice at Let me also toss in that um, uh, that chart really was about trends, not raw numbers, because you're right. There are lots of reasons people also wouldn't report cases in Westlaw. So it, it really was about numbers. Right. Um, but 
I'll have a set of numbers in a moment that may actually go to this. Can you very quickly directly. explain what Westlaw is? Oh, I'm sorry. Westlaw is basically a, it's, it's a system by, whereby cases are uh, reported. They're, they're held in a database so that lawyers like me can go and research and see what the case law is on any particular issue to cite them in briefs and for our legal research. Not every case is the subject of a, uh, a report in Westlaw. So yes, there, there, there is. But I, I did believe going through the data, you could at least capture some trends. So. There's no data tree. It's a requirement to enter stuff. Absolutely right. right. How, exactly. So how, how, like, who decides what? Well, who decides what goes? Judges. Yeah, I think it's what some judges. Of the judges. 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 Yes. Um, OK, so for me, I, I would like to see the core language addressed. But failing that, and there is a, a real challenge on getting alignment on um, on getting language for what authorization means. Um, but failing that, I would like to see section G removed. Now, the good thing is that when we have the panel, there's going to be some debate over that because, you know, there are very legitimate reasons for section G. And fortunately, Kristen from Microsoft is going to help us understand what some of those are. Um, but that, that, that would be my personal thing. If I was king for a day, no, why do I always do that? I'm a girl. If I was queen for a day, I would take out or section president. G. Um, all right, so a couple of other criticisms of the CFA. Um, these are not researcher specific, but these are the two biggies that we've not covered so far. So the first is um, that it is aggressively used for cases that probably shouldn't be um, CFA violations, and the other is harsh penalties. So Laurie Drew is the very famous example that people use for aggr ex aggressive use. So very quickly, um, Laurie Drew was a woman whose daughter was being bullied. And she was incensed about this. And so she went onto MySpace, and she created an account posing as a teenage boy. And she flirted with her daughter's bully. And eventually, after she'd got sort of into a quasi-relationship with her daughter's bully, she kind of ended the relationship and then started bullying the bully. And unfortunately, the girl took it very hard, and she killed herself. So when this happened, understandably, there was a sort of outcry. People felt that this was a huge tragedy and that something needed to be done. And so because there was no real other way to go at Laurie Drew, uh, they used the CFAA. And they said, MySpace's terms of service say that you cannot misrepresent who you are, which again goes back to that match.com example, not super, not super dissimilar. So she was prosecuted under the CFAA for this. And, and she was convicted, and then it was overturned in appeals. That's right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> OK, so this is used as a very famous example of the overreach, the overaggressive use of the CFA. In terms of harsh penalties, um, there, there is a, a lot of criticism, and I think we'll go into this much more in the panel, and, and Leonard will also speak to it in his next section. But there's a lot of criticism that um, the, the penalties are, are high, and that a lot of people's efforts to reform actually look at increasing penalties, minimizing the number of uh, um, misdemeanors, uh, making things much more into felonies, that kind of thing, which is a huge challenge, because most people I know who work in cybersecurity started out cutting their teeth by doing some things that were a little questionable legally. And that's how you learn, and that curiosity is actually a pretty healthy part of our, our community. So if you have a situation where you're likely to face serious prison time for that, then that becomes a real problem for our community, which considering we also already have a skill shortage, could, uh, could exacerbate that problem quite a lot. Back to you, my friend. Thank you. So I just want to rush through some information about how the CFA is, in fact, being used. Ideally, to give you a little bit of comfort about the way in which we actually administer the the statute. Um, one thing on Lori Drew I would say is, Lori Drew, that was a case that was tried in 2008. Um, upon appeal, uh, did, uh, upon having the case reversed, we did not appeal that, and there has not been a, a case since then in which we've used that theory. Um, so how does the Department of Justice approach the CFAA? The thing I would flag is every year we have about 55,000 uh, federal cases that are filed that involve sort of the things that you'd imagine. Um, immigration violations, uh, firearm violations, uh, narcotics violations. Uh, now, in that mass of 55,000 or so, you've got 153 computer fraud uh, cases. Um, yes, sir? Just a question before you dive into this. 
are there degrees to CFA, and if they're not, should there be, like, is there first degree, second degree? Yes, there are misdemeanors and felonies. That'll be the, I think, the next slide, the one after that. So yes, I'll get to that. Um, so 153 cases, the lion's share are what I think we would all agree are, are bad guys. Um, none of you. One thing we did, uh, we, as I uh, mentioned, we administer the network of prosecutors across the country, about 300 prosecutors in 94 different districts, who bring these cases. And we did a data call. We said, in the last five years, can you tell us how many cases you've had, prosecutors or investigations, that have had uh, involved computer security researchers who are engaged in computer security research? And the answer for those five years was less than five, um, all cases that were in the press that we all know about. So at, at the end of the day, what we had is about two tenths of a percent of the cases that are brought a year are computer fraud cases. And about six tenths of a percent of that two percent involved computer security researchers. Um, so it, it is very, 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 very unusual for a computer security researcher to, to end up in, in a federal criminal case. The trend has not been you know, violently different over the years, the last five years, from 138 cases alone to 194 from last year. Now, to your point, yes, there is a felony and a misdemeanor uh, violation of 1030A2. Um, it is a misdemeanor, unless you have one of these aggravating Factor one, it was offense committed for the purposes of commercial advantage or private financial gain. It was committed in furtherance of any criminal or tortious act, um, or the value of the information obtained exceeds five thousand dollars. Wow, five thousand dollars. Why is that not in next certification? So it's it, 1986 dollars, right? right? No, so, uh, no, it's later than that. It was updated later than that. 5, yeah, it was updated, but but, but still, it's old. It, that, this yeah. is a question, and it's so one thing that I think we're looking at. We'll get to it in a moment. <laughs> No, it's not. It, for sensing purposes, it would go to the damage loss, but it is not the value of the information obtained, <coughs> right, under the statute. Now, that said, people have criticized the statute, and they believe that they can get the $5,000 fairly quickly. Uh, I, I will concede that. Um, that that is one of the issues that, that has come up repeatedly. <laughs> I don't know who. <laughs> yeah. OK, I think we have a few questions, and we're really behind on okay, time. Sorry. So we're going to race through, and then when we we'll get, get to the, the panel, panel we'll, yes. ask, we'll open the questions. So I'll keep motoring. So just so you know, uh, just how the courts have viewed a CFA violation compared to other crimes, securities fraud, healthcare fraud, ID theft. Um, typically, the, the sentence for a CFAA um, violation on, on average is 23 months. Now, understand that that's for a crime where the maximum is five years, where you may have multiple counts. Invariably, there is something called the US Sentencing Guidelines that help courts determine where to fix a sentence. Um, and the sentencing guidelines were created because there were concerns <coughs> way back in the 1970s about disparity in sentencing. They actually took judges, asked them to sentence a whole bunch of similarly situated defendants who were notional, not real, and found that judges had violently different uh, sentences that they imposed. So they created the sentencing guide guidelines that have a, a very complicated matrix of offense characteristics, characteristics of the, um, of the offender, uh, various aggravating circumstances that, that sets out what is a guideline range that would be seen as, as reasonable. In roughly 50% of the cases, judges will sentence a defendant to within the guideline range. In about 49% of the cases, in both computer fraud and abuse cases and federal offenses, they will sentence a defendant below the guideline range. You will have a judge departing above the guideline range in roughly around 1% of the cases that are brought in the federal system. You're not seeing maxed out defendants in the federal system for CFAA violations, demonstrably. OK, so Leonard, if that's the case, if, if judges are typically sentencing below the guidelines, why do people want to increase the penalties? Fair question. Um, so I, I believe that generally, <coughs> Congress does view this issue of the length of sentencing as some indication of the importance and concern about the crime. So yes, there has been uh, a, a drive to 
increase certain sentences. So for example, where we didn't see that there was sufficient punishment potentially for a critical infrastructure system. We might say, hey, we think there should be an aggravator for someone who breaks into you know, the electric grid and causes some, some, some sort of damage there that might result in large uh, you know, casualties. Uh, again, I think sensing is one of the harder things because there's a line drawing function and people disagree mightily about where the right punishment should be. Um, I'm just going to skip through this one in the interest of time. Yeah, these actually go to court. I mean, usually they, they, they agree with Well, I mean, the federal system generally you have a 93% plea rate. Um, I guess I would disagree that that's because of draconian sensing. I would say that usually that's because we tend to bring a federal case when we have very, very, very good evidence. Um, you know, and so the benefits of going to trial versus pleading militate in favor of pleading in those instances. Um, so it's yours. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about some of the reform um, suggestions that have been made uh, in the past couple of years. Um, so the first, the most famous, is Aaron's Law. Uh, how many people have heard of Aaron's Law? All right, most of you, so I'm going to be super brief on this. Um, so uh, I'm not going to talk about where Aaron's Law came from because you guys are presumably familiar with that story. Um, and basically, what it looks to do is uh, three main things. One, it would make commercial terms of service no longer a violation of the CFA. Uh, two, it would try and create a little bit more um, crispness over what uh, authorization means. In other words, you would have to circumvent a technological protection, which is very like the DMCA. Um, and then the third is basically saying that um, you can't be done for, the, for multiple counts of the same thing in one go, um, and it would increase the, the, it would, sorry, change the way that the value of information is being figured out. Um, the reality is on this, Aaron's Law is not likely to pass. Uh, I did get reintroduced, um, but it, it is incredibly contentious um, for a number of reasons, partly because of what's in it, but mostly because of political attachments and associations with Aaron and Sopra Pippa. So Aaron's, not, Aaron's law is not likely to move. And this will come up on the panel. I guess I have some questions. I think Nate probably will address these. Yeah. So whether Aaron's law actually makes the world clearer than the CFA. <coughs> the discussion. But um, administration proposal. Last year, the administration um, had its own proposal for dealing with the CFA. Um, actually, what we see as one of the problems about the CFA is not so much the authorization issue, but that it applies to any information. So if you obtain any information, essentially, under the CFA under A2, you are facing potential of a criminal prosecution. What we would propose is to cabin the information proposal to make that more specific to a certain type of information that would be more indicative of criminal conduct. So um, it has these elements, $5,000 or more, the furthers of a fel felony or stored on a government computer. Now, this ran into a trouble not really for the A2 provisions. In fact, we heard not a lot of criticism of the A2 amendments. It was the fact that we, at the same time, were requesting other authority to go after other types of crime. And the sorts of things that we had listed as additional authority we wanted drew some fire from, from folks in the community saying, we think that these are too expansive and capture conduct that that would implicate, for example, computer security researchers. It would be fair to say that when the administration came out with this proposal, they heard from me a lot. Interestingly, um, that was not our intent. And we could explain why each of these provisions were included. And in view of that, we actually attempted to amend it in various ways that would still allow us to go after what we were attempting to go after while minimizing the likelihood that it would in implicate computer security researchers. Uh, yeah. One last thing on that, uh, just before you go back to it. So this little tiny sort of throwaway bullet point at the bottom that, that yes. you know, Leonard's kind of stuck in there, amended password traffic offense, sounds so innocuous. Um, amongst other things, that would have made Metasploit illegal, uh, which was kind of awesome. So we were on a call. There was a whole bunch of people giving feedback. I was the only non-lawyer on the call, so I was very quiet, very intimidated. And uh, the, the folks from the White House said, Jen, you haven't said anything. What do you think? And I went, well, 
you've made Metasploit illegal. <laughs> and there was this silence, and then they just went, oh, fuck. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> they were like, yeah, we didn't mean to do that. We'll have to look at it again. <laughs> For the record, we don't actually think we did, but. Yeah. <laughs> you totally did. <laughs> um, so the, the good thing is, though, that through this whole process, we went backwards and forwards, and they were really, really receptive to feedback. And they never gave up, even though this was not going to be a version that went to Congress. Um, they continued to listen to the feedback. They continued to make adjustments. And that meant that when this came out, um, there was some of the feedback that we had provided was reflected in this. So basically, Senators Graham and White House created a, um, uh, a draft proposal based largely on what the administration had come up with, but also had a number of other things. It was initially called the International Cybercrime Prevention Act. Then they shortened it down to be an amendment to CISA that didn't get accepted as an amendment. Um, then they reintroduced it this year, and it's called something like Prevention of Botnets, Botnet Prevention Act. Um, and they're still working on it. So there's likely to be another version introduced that has some other stuff in it. Um, and basically, it addresses the terms of service issue. So it basically says commercial terms of service is not, is not a violation. Um, it adds in some stuff to address botnets, as you would assume from the title. So um, what they're trying to get at is if you are someone who didn't create the botnet, but you're selling access to it, today the law can't really cope with that. So that's why they've added this sort of means of access. Um, again, we had to do some back and forth over whether that captured things like research and Metasploit. Um, so the language got adjusted. And again, the thing I would say that's good about this is in the past year since they came out with the original ICPA, um, the staffers have been really, really receptive to talking about this and making changes. So we eventually got to a point where all the big criticisms that we had from a research point of view, they had actually addressed. And the version that came out as a CISA amendment at the end of last year, which as I said, did not move forward to CISA, um, actually was pretty much, I would say, neutral for researchers. It definitely did not make the situation worse for researchers. There are other things in it that people may not like um, that we may get to in the panel, depending on how much time we have. Um, but I would keep an eye on this one. Again, this is not going to move. I mean, for those who don't know, there's kind of some stuff going on in politics at the moment. And um, it's really unlikely that anything is going to move anytime soon. But I think it's very likely that next year we will see um, Senators Graham and White House and possibly one or two others pick up an updated version of this bill and reintroduce it. So next year we're likely to see another CFAA reform effort. So that brings us to the panel discussion. So I'm going to ask my panelists to come up. Oh, why do I keep looking at my... Uh... <laughs> uh, really, however you want to. I'm next to Leonard on the screen, so I'll be next to Leonard in real life. Is that so you can punch him? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and you shouldn't, I mean, you guys shouldn't read too much into who is and isn't wearing the I'm a criminal shirt. No. Uh, uh, OK, so uh, yeah, OK. So I'm going to actually let the panelists introduce themselves real quick. I'm Kristen Goodman. I'm a cybersecurity lawyer at Microsoft. Hi, I'm Todd Beardsley. I am the security research manager at Rapid7, and I have my hands in Metasploit quite a bit, too. <laughs> I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco, and I work on our coders' rights team representing people like you against people like him. <laughs> like me. Oh, him. And I'm people like him. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, to be fair, also against people like Kristen. Okay. <laughs> and, and like, you know, guys, I think one thing that you should, you should just kind of give them all a hand because Kristen and Leonard both knew what they were in for coming to do this. They both knew that they were likely to have us kind of uh, villainize them a little bit and they still agreed to come and they're being really good sports. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so did everyone everyone win? All right. So um, really, we're going to keep this super simple. We've really got two questions that we're going to ask people. Uh, one is if you can just do a quick round of what do you think of the CFA? How do you feel about it as it is today? And then we're going to ask people like what they think should happen with it. 
and that's probably when we're going to get a little bit more into the debate session. And um, and then if we have time, which hopefully will, and I will stop checking my wrist because there's nothing on it, uh, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. And we're running straight into lunch, so if people want to stay, you're welcome to, but um, <laughs> Leonard has to get the hell out of here before we start bombing him. <laughs> Alright, so do you want to just go first on what you think of the CFA? Who wants to go first? I think Paige should go first. Oh, okay. I'll go first. <laughs> um, the CFAA is vague, overbroad, not understandable, and creates serious chilling effects in almost all areas of my practice. Uh, the exceeds authorized access uh, definition that, that Leonard and Jen talked about earlier is fatally vague. We can't put that into practice. Um, and actually, in my practice, and this goes to a question that we had earlier, um, the, the slide that, that they showed with civil versus criminal, my practice is almost exclusively civil CFAA. Uh, my clients get civil CFAA threats up one side and down the other. Um, you know, Twitch TV, which is owned now by Amazon, uh, is suing a number of people who run bots to, to increase advertising. And it, that's a, it's a perfectly acceptable lawsuit. Uh, Twitch needs to protect its business. They have uh, unfair competition problems here. They have trademark problems here. They have breach of contract problems here. And of course, they threw in a CFAA cause of action because the people running these bots on Twitch are violating Twitch's terms of service and knows will be damned. They're still going to uh, claim it. That's a problem, right? That's not hacking. The CFAA criminalizes and makes civilly illegal all sorts of things that aren't hacking. We need to fix that. Uh, and Aaron's Law went a little bit of the way uh, towards fixing that. Oracle stepped in and killed it uh, in its infancy um, because Oracle is Oracle and that's what they do. Um, and so, you know, there, there are a lot of things that CFAA makes illegal that should be illegal, that people should go to jail for. And there are a lot of things, like port, port scanning should never be illegal, sort of full stop. There's no reason that anyone should ever go to jail for port scanning. Um, and as, uh, oh, I see. I as, that question, not you. as as Leonard said, right, will they go to jail? It depends. And that answer is unacceptable. And, and he's, I'm not saying that, that Leonard's answer is unacceptable, because he's right, right? Uh, it does depend, and it shouldn't. So I mean, Microsoft has used the CFAA in, in several civil actions. It's not something that we use often, but it has been a part of our digital crimes unit strategy. So that when we're looking at um, um, some of our botnet takedowns and malware eradication cases, it's a, it's a useful tool. And when you look at our, our complaints that we file, our civil complaints, it's usually one of six or seven causes of action that we'll bring in a civil case. Uh, typically, we're not going for the you know, billions of dollars types of remedies. We're looking for civil injunctions. You know, whoever is the, the bot herder, uh, you know, the Citadel botnet, the, the botnet uh, uh, creator had a, a CRM associated with it and was working on providing a, a really bespoke, customized uh, botnet solution for uh, his customers. And so we use the CFAA as a tool to help bring a case against that individual to stop him. You know, it's the kind of thing where you look at it as a civil tool. Should that be the, the, the realm of the uh, police officers and, and, and Leonard's base in the DOJ? Quite possibly, but we were seeing such an impact against millions of our customers. It was a tool that we could use to help protect them, and it's been an important tool for us. Why, why is it a better tool to use than going the criminal route? Why a better tool than going what? criminal? So I don't think this one can. Can we turn this, this mic on? Are there, are it's, any of the mics on? Yes. Yeah, no. nah, sort of. So, hello, is it me you're looking for? So the, the question was, uh, uh, why not go criminal? Well, it's a matter of philosophy. You know, we're not looking necessarily to, to bring a, a criminal case. We're looking to, to find the best remedy to help protect our customers. And so if it's to get the botnet taken down, uh, we'll, we'll look at the CFAA as a tool. It's actually surprising how few uh, companies use that or use Lanham Act Kate claims or, or uh, other, other IP related claims to try to, to, to do this. But it's a, it's a legal way of, of community policing when the police aren't there. So like 
Jen said earlier, um, she surveyed the entire internet, found that uh, through the NTIA survey, found that 65% of the uh, researchers had had some kind of run-in. Um, Nate's practice is almost entirely consumed by, by runs with CAA, CFA that are almost entirely civil. Um, and, and that's, you know, let, like if I had my druthers as well, yeah, sure, let's knock out, you know, the, the, the civil um, component of CFA, but clearly uh, you're using it, <laughs> um, yeah. right? So, there are times when it's used for good. Sure. Um, but, yeah. <gasps> when I asked around every Metasploit contributor um, just a few months ago, um, I said, hey, have you guys ever had a threat on the CFAA? And if so, would you like to talk about it? Um, it was about 400, we have about 400 historical contributors over the whole life of Metasploit. Um, there's a couple in this room. And um, I got a lot of responses uh, so I got no responses back of I've ever had a CFA threat. Um, I got no, I got none of those. I had about of the 400, I had about 40 or so that said I've had. I, I'm worried about it, and please let me know what you're going to be doing with this. And I, and I know a friend, like a couple knew a guy who knew a guy. Um, there were a couple that were outside of the U.S. that had their own run-ins in Australia. And mm -hmm. yes, so so there, yeah, so there was that. Um, but it wasn't CFA specific. Um, but the fact that the respondents all like felt like, like, like it's kind of textbook chilling, right? Like, th because they're so worried about it, like that's kind of like half of, I, I wouldn't say half, but, it, but it's, it's some large percentage of the reason why like I kind of picked up this vulnerability disclosure mantle at Rapid7 so we could help the Metasploit contributors like do uh, disclosure, publish exploits that prove vulnerabilities and do all that because we, I have, you know, the, the good luck of having like awesome Boston lawyers, awesome EFF lawyers on my side that, that regular researchers, you know, who are maybe even hobbyists, this is not their real job, maybe they're pen testers, maybe they're just software developers, that they feel very very uncomfortable doing on their on their own. I think things are changing now with the advent of bug bounties and how that's all getting normalized or has been normalized. Um, and you have things like the Pentagon saying like, hey, it's it you know recognizing at least that some things are okay to test. Um, but I mean, fundamentally, the the original question of like, how do you feel about the CFA? Um, I, I'm, I'm with Nate. There are reasons to prosecute people criminally, um, and I know that people are using the CFA as a tool in their civil uh, practice. But when you have issues like the recent early morning, uh, <laughs> you know, it was like a time machine, right? So, like in May, uh, Justin Schaefer, who uh, found that there was an FTP server with hard-coded credentials that had health data uh, listed on it. This was in Houston, Texas. Yeehaw, Texas. Um, and he got raided, uh, you know, at gunpoint by FBI guys, uh, you know, right out of, you know, Hacker's movie. And it felt like, like, I woke up that morning and it felt like it was like 1988 all over again. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, th th there aren't a lot of criminal prosecutions, but when there are ones like that one, real recent, that it really hurts. It really hurts. And I know you're a nice guy, Leonard. <laughs> so I wouldn't let everyone else speak because I've talked a lot already. But l let me point, uh, say a few things. The first one being, one of the challenges we face at the Department of Justice as, as policymakers is that we don't have the luxury of simply saying, too hard, right? We, we have a job to do that is to go out and try to deter people who are clearly using this in criminal ways to take information they shouldn't, um, to invade people's privacy, um, to do damage to computers. And we want to make sure we preserve our ability to do that um, while listening to, to, to concerns from a community that we think is very important um, and figuring out exactly how we navigate that, uh, this distinction is, is not simple because while addressing the concerns here, we're going to make sure that, again, we don't open some huge gap in the statute that makes it harder for us to go after people who I think we would all agree we should be going after. I think one thing that makes this difficult going forward is essentially that is a terrific, well-crafted statute, said no one ever. <laughs> I mean, simply put, for many years, the spackle that has held together statutes from overreach and or being overbroad at times is a view that prosecutorial discretion 
would take care of that. And in recent years, in recent years, I think that is uh, a concept that is you know, not accepted as well. It's, it's, it's something that people are not as comfortable with. So the goal is to draft statutes that are very narrowly tailored that only capture criminal conduct and nothing else. And to give you an example of how difficult that can be, I think this would be the logical parallel, I understand it's different, but I think there's an analog here, to saying, you know the problem with, with cybersecurity is bad code. So you should just write perfect programs. <laughs> because there's always some use of a, of a program that you did not anticipate. Something that someone will do that's on the fringes. And that by and large is what the statutes are doing. They're trying to by and large go after criminal conduct. There are fringe cases in which there may be issues. I think many of these instances are kind of fringe-ish, but still concerns because what you're doing is very important. And so figuring out how to address these concerns while leaving what we need to do intact, I think is one of our, our big challenges. So I want to address something that Leonard said. I, I agree with 98% of what he just said. Um, but the, I want to make a point about prosecutorial discretion. Uh, we have, in, in our criminal justice system in the United States, we rely on prosecutorial discretion all the time. Who here drives faster than the posted speed limit? Right, everybody. We, we assume that the, that the cops aren't going to pull you over unless you're driving a lot faster than the speed limit or in the rain or if it's dangerous other, otherwise or, you know, if you're black, but we can talk about that in, an, in another panel. Um, <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> uh, and prosecutorial discretion is, is a necessary component of our criminal justice system, but... Uh, we don't have the sorts of bounds that we need to on it. Uh, and I want to make a special call out here to the Dutch government. The Dutch government released earlier this year a binding set of prosecutorial guidelines uh, in computer crimes specifically. The Dutch equivalent of the CFAA, which has some fancy Dutch name, now has a set of binding guidelines that prosecutors must abide by. So even if something is a technical violation of the law, if no one was really hurt by it, and the hacker who, who did the technical violation of the law had, didn't have malicious intent, even if they might have satisfied mens rea, there's no prosecution. We need something like that in the states. We need uh, good folks like Leonard to say, look, you all, you all being US attorneys in the 94 districts, 94? 94. 94 districts all around the country, um, don't prosecute these crimes unless someone was really hurt. The, the Aaron Schwartz prosecution was done by the United States Attorney for the District of Massachusetts, right? Not by CSIPS at Maine Justice. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Massachusetts can do whatever she wants. Um, we need to make that not as true anymore, specifically in computer crimes. Um, and I would point to the Dutch prosecutorial guidelines as at least a good starting point on this. I have to put pressure on the, the notion of how laws evolve. You know, as you think about uh, uh, what we do in the property law, you know, we heard Leonard start with the fact that, that these computer crime laws are based in trespass and property law. Well, you don't see people constantly going up to their neighbor's house testing if their doors are actually locked. And you don't see people uh, trying to go into their neighborhood company and give a physical security review. You know, the, the analogy broke down, and it broke down a good 10 to 15 years ago. And we have not had that public dialogue about the next generation of actual computer law. You know, the computer fraud and abuse act isn't really talking in, in a lot of instances about fraud or abuse. It's talking about straight up criminality and crime. And so, you know, we at Microsoft, when, when researchers provide us uh, vuln details and we can use those to issue a patch, you know, we, we put the finders' names in our security bulletins. And we look at this globally. You know, the CFAA is an inherently American problem, but we're working with finders all around the world. And it's... But, but with this discussion about the CFAA, how do we solve this issue and, and to set a new global standard? You know, when, when we had the Budapest Convention come out uh, and everybody went forth and created cybercrime laws in their countries, you know, that was what, 20 years ago? 15 years ago? It's, it's, the internet has changed so dramatically and how we think about crime and criminality has changed to the point where it's, it's really incumbent upon us to 
to get the community together again and, and provide our own draft law. What is a crime? What is the exceeding of authorization? What are the boundaries from a trespass perspective? And what are the rights of researchers? There's a place for all of us to have that conversation. It, it's just not been convened because we keep getting shoehorned back into the CFAA space when that may not be the right starting point at all. So I'm, I'm, what do we have, five people up here? I can math. Um, I'm, I'm one of two non-lawyers sitting at this table, and I know that there's like also like this massive cultural disconnect between attorneys and coders, right? And so when, when coders and hackers see laws like the CFAA, they, it screams ambiguity, and when security researchers and hackers in particular see something that's ambiguous, that is, oh, that, that's something to exploit, right? And, and and I and and I think I, I think it could go a long way if um, you know, kind of looking at like where do we see the CFA going in the future, of of really nailing down this whole notion of prosecutorial discretion, of having the you know this this stopgap that Nate's talking about, um, having real like serious guidelines on on prosecutions because. You know, as long as you have this, like, or anything else kind of clause in CFAA, um, I mean, it's going to, it, it will continue to chill researchers who would otherwise be, be doing good, right, of, of exposing vulnerabilities and, you know, letting consumers decide things and finding flaws before bad guys do or possibly concurrently or maybe after bad guys do who haven't said anything. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, I, I think there's a, th that cultural disconnect is, it can, feeds a lot of the angst into CFAA. I mean, beyond what's actually written in the law. Uh, so I, let me just uh, respond to one thing. Um, uh, let me say that we actually do have U.S. prosecutorial guidelines on bringing CFAA prosecutions that have been in effect for the last year. Uh, and there's a required consultation requirement with us at Maine Justice for any CFA prosecution that is brought. Um, I can also tell you personally, having reviewed some of those cases, that we have consulted against bringing uh, some cases that have, in fact, not been brought. So I guess with the hats off to the Dutch authorities, um, USA, USA, USA. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. Flaming George, um, the two things that we were asking for was we wanted prosecutorial guidelines and we wanted centralization through CSIPs. Because once we met with the CSIPs, we were like, oh, you're, you're kind of not idiots. You kind of get this and you actually care about the issues. So then we were like, oh, well, then all federal prosecutors should have to talk to you guys because you actually understand computer crime. And so the fact that there has been like forward motion on that stuff is super cool and, and like I'm not bringing this up to be like oh we asked for this and they did what we told them to do. Actually not what happened at all. They were already thinking about it. Just It was just a coincidental timing. But the point is like that there is progress being made which kind of leads us into the next question. So what, what additional progress should be made? Where do we go from here? And what do you think like not only in terms of what you would like to see happen, what, what do you think will happen? Um. So one of the things that, that we see at EFF a lot is because we're a national, actually we're a global, but for this purpose, uh, a national organization, is that federal law is only you know one of uh, 53 plus legal systems in the United States. And we have state equivalents to the CFAA in, I believe, every state. Um, and it's whack-a-mole, right? We got a researcher exemption passed in Washington, yay. Uh, but then in Rhode Island, they were they had an update to to their state equivalent of the CFAA that would have defined organic devices or would have as computers they included organic devices. Okay, so they're starting to think about interesting future stuff uh, in terms of access. They also included the word approach, uh, and in, and in in the definition of computer, they included anything that can respond to a command. So you can't approach a trained dog <laughs> without authorization. That's now a CFAA violation in Rhode Island, or it would have been had we not gotten the bill killed in committee. So my prediction is probably no movement in the Fed system and movement all over the place in every conceivable direction in the 50 states. Yeah, and that's kind of a giant problem, right? Because the internet doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't log into my Texas internet. 
um, you know, the the internet is global, and and to have that kind of fractured interpretation, I guess, of CFAA um, does 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 a ton of harm. And so, I don't know, like if we could get like drop it, dropping the civil component would be lovely, and I doubt it'll ever happen. Unfortunately, um, I mean that would knock out eighty percent of just notionally, like all those blue bars, like that all goes away, right, on the graph. So, we'll find a new way. We're lawyers. Right, but that's the thing, right, is that there, there are other tools out there for sure. There's DMCA. Yay, DMCA. There, <laughs> there's the wiretapping, which is what I think almost always comes along with, with at least criminal prosecutions. There's almost always some kind of wiretapping component to it anyway, so just use that. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and there's there 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 are other bodies of law that are that are better suited to this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd love I I'm I am exceedingly happy with what's going what's been going on for the last I'd say two years, um, 2014 and on. Um, you know, but for these blips in in Houston, Texas, where dentist hackers get get guns pointed at their faces, that's not cool. <laughs> dentist hackers? So he's a dentist. He's a hacker. He is he he hacks dentist <laughs> software. So. Um, and hacks meaning researches and you know responsibly and reasonably discloses vulnerabilities. So you guys all just heard Microsoft say that they'd be fine with Section G going away, right? That's what I heard. <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, are we are we uh, wedded to the to the concept of Section G? I think we're wedded to the right that, that we need a tool that enables us to go after. Uh, the, the worst of the worst that are, are attacking our customers and, and our users around the world. Does it have to sit inside a, a criminal statute where it's it's a potentially an afterthought? Not necessarily. Uh, you know, the, the, the broader point is that we look globally for tools that we can use to stop uh, malware from being propagated in, in really harmful ways. And we look for ways to stop bot herders at scale, not, uh, you know, onesie twosies, but when we're seeing a million infections a month, three million infections a month. And so for us, G is, is a tool, but, but its, its relationship to the CFAA is certain, just by virtue of the fact that it's, it's there. And so does it, does it have to stay? Not necessarily. We'd want another tool in its place, probably one better crafted, but uh, we worked with what we have because we've got a duty to protect people. What actually happened to FTP dentist? Because I know about the raid, he was arrested, guns in his face and all of that, but is he actually charged? Is he like off with slammer? Uh, well, I, I can, so I, I can't comment extensively on a pending matter, but I can tell you that um, there was a search, which is what was laid out there. There have not been charges filed. Okay. You know, and then I, I, I'm going to point out. So that's all right then, because, you know, raids with guns. And <laughs> well, that's it. Well, no, no, right. So I'm going to jump on this too. And that, because, <laughs> I think that's part of one of the things we have to be careful of for security researchers. Every case out there, there's the fringe ones that get a lot of press sure. for everything. And it depends, also goes to our murder statute, because if I kill somebody in self-defense and I ask the prosecutor, hey, am I going to be charged? They're going to come back with, well, it depends, and you know, <laughs> the investigation is going to go out. So it, it's consistent with our system. Yeah, and I, I, I don't want to, you know, be the voice of defending the DOJ. Hell, hell no do I want to be that. Um, but I do want to be clear that, that Leonard is not defending this action at all. He cannot comment on it because it is an ongoing situation. Um, but he's not, I didn't hear anything that he said that sounded like defense. Yeah, right. But uh, let me also say, I mean, in terms of going forward, in my opinion, we need a CFAA-like statute. And w the reason I say that is, one, people have kind of in a hand wavy way said, can't we just do something else? So let's take the wire fraud statute. A scheme or artifice to defraud someone of, of money, essentially. If you want to talk about something that's vague and broad, um, <laughs> I, I think you would not want us using that in lieu of a much more specific technical statute that's intended at least to get to this. Are there any cases brought in which the CFAA is the only statute that those crimes can be charged with? There, so this is, a, this is a question. So it depends on the facts again. So um, we often have a CFAA as a standalone offense, and there are reasons for that. So for example, we had tried uh, one individual um, 
And we learned uh, through the appellate court that apparently digital information is not considered property under the inter inter, uh, state theft of stolen property statute, right? Um, those things happen. Trade secrets, well, they may take a trade secret, but trade secret is a specific term defined under 18 U.S.C. 1839 and not everything is a trade secret. So there's a question, for example, at times of customer lists or credit card numbers or passwords satisfying the definition of a trade secret, things that are often stolen. So it, it is often not as simple as finding simply another statute that's plug and play, depending upon the facts. I think we're in a better place if we actually have a statute that reaches conduct of this sort that is specific to conduct of this sort. So can I, let's let's move on to I, another yeah, yeah, question. Just real quick, very quickly before we move on to questions, I just want to ask the audience a question. Does anybody here think that there should not be an anti-hacking law? Define hacking? <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Council has a question. <laughs> yeah. uh, so one of the biggest concerns I have with the CFAA is the lack of tolerance when the subjectively interpreted line is crossed. It's enormously chilling to worry that if I pursue my curiosity, I could risk a felony charge that will effectively preclude me from ever getting a job in tech again. I mean, that I may spend two years in jail uh, is a very su significant concern, but it's also a lifelong sentence of never getting a job. And, you know, some examples of conduct which I used to consider uh, fairly innocuous or would have considered reasonable security research, but had a CFAA uh, like um, action against them. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to mention Chelsea Manning, not to defend what he did, but one of the charges under Chelsea Manning was computer fraud solely for use of the wget command in Linux to access information he otherwise had authority to access with a web browser. And that is utterly nonsensical to me but he got successfully convicted under that uh, and 11 other charges. Uh, another one would be um, Weave, Andrew Arnheimer Weave, very contentious person, uh, to say the least, especially after what he, yeah, anyways. Uh, uh, to me, I see someone who uh, got convicted for iterate, for using arithmetic on a URL. Uh, oh, I'm publicly, uh, at and um, AT&T had to expose a lot of consumer information that was not protected of a password. The only thing you need to do to get different information on different customers was iterate through a URL, uh, like add one to user ID, add one to user ID, you get a different user. And yet that's effectively a computer fraud charge that he was gone after. And that's kind of insane to me as that's, uh, you know, his intent aside, uh, the action that he was um, gone after for was arithmetic on, on a public URL. And the last one would be uh, Fidel Sal uh, Salinas, who was on about a three-year legal battle with the DOJ uh, for run unsuccessfully running a web fuzzer on a public-facing uh, web form. Uh, he was originally con uh, charged with 44 uh, violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, for unsuccessfully for unsuccessfully gaining access to a, uh, a protected computer, every single time his web buzzing tool had put an input was a new charge, which is just silly to me. Uh, but you know that kind of stuff is very chilling. In his his case, after three years, all felony charges were dropped, but it was a long, prolonged, uh, protected legal battle. So I just wanted to give these examples of other cases other than uh, Aaron Schwartz where, you know, there's been chilling effects uh, by the DOJ and FBI uh, regarding Computer Rod and Abuse Act. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. There, there, are, there are obviously other examples than the ones we provided, um, and we, we had a limit on time, so we chose the ones to focus on. Um, I think Weave is probably the one that is most relevant to this room, and um, I think, you know, the that most people that I hear from uh, would agree that uh, Weave's case should not create an expectation that um, that that kind of activity is a violation of the law. However, on the flip side, you don't need to do something 200,000 times to do a proof of concept. 
No, Pat, I will debate this with you after. <laughs> My view. Tiki <laughs> bar. Um, yeah, right, exactly. For sure. I'll go um, All right, so there's, there's so I do appreciate you coming, first of all, and, and coming to a, what could be a hostile crowd. And I agree with Jen that I've heard generally good things when I've heard CSIP sp speakers. But last week I was attending the CLE, which is continuing education for lawyers. And one of your colleagues, Brian Ressler, specifically used the words jack up in the context of, we work with companies to jack up the damages they're claiming so that we can get some real prison time for people we're charging. Can you talk about how common that is at CSIPS? Because again, this is a senior trial attorney at CSIPS. I, I guess I need to know exactly what he said. I mean, I, 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 that was I, the context. I, right. Well, yeah. that, I mean, I, so if the question is, do we search for additional charges to pile on to get longer sentences? Additional damages. This is just the damage calculation specifically. The right. numbers for the sentencing guidelines. Right. So I mean, we will actually ask a victim. What was the damage? There are, uh, I think, the question earlier asked the question about like what goes into the hopper. There, there are things like what were the expenses you had to incur as a result of this intrusion? For example, did you have to repair your system and scrub them to make sure there was no other back door inserted? There are things like that that we do tally up in an attempt to make sure that there's a reflection of the actual harm. It, it would not be appropriate to spuriously. Um, keep on additional offenses or damage that was not actually incurred. Um, so I, 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 that's the best I can do with the, the facts you, you, you gave me. Um, uh, one quick thing on what was said earlier. I mean, I, I agree with Jen that I think, I think the Arnheimer and Spitler matter was probably the sole case I know of that is a pure computer security research or CFAA matter, I mean, as in the purest form. Um, and I think it is a very, very hard case. One thing that we have talked about, and I can say this is a, actually pointing a finger back at the community, is we're trying to figure out whether there's a way that we can provide you guys with a way of avoiding um, situations where we are most likely to prosecute. So for example, in an instance where I believe it was 114,000 times with a script that the information was downloaded. Um, our ability to distinguish between, one, a bad guy and a good guy who's now holding a whole lot of private information that we're not clear why there was a need to possess may be the difference between the way that we look at the matter. That seems like it would be in stark contrast to saying, I've proved that this, happened, this is possible, gone to the company and said, you've got this problem without also having in your hand a whole cache of information that those customers never asked you to possess. So uh, that's, that's what we struggle with. That's true. And in a perfect world, they would not have done that, and there wouldn't be another cache of information out in the world of that private information. So there, that's the, that, that's, if there are ways in which we can get the community to maybe consider some ways of adopting practices that will reduce the likelihood of, of us looking at an act as criminal. The problem is it, it's a very complicated community. And finding a center of gravity through which such guidance would proliferate is not actually simple. Um, so to answer the, your, your question about loss and damage calculation, it's, ex it's ex exceedingly common. So Matthew Keyes, who was the LA Times reporter who gave login credentials to the LA Times uh, CMS to Anonymous, um, one headline was changed to, I don't remember, it was some silly Anonymous joke, um, for 45 minutes. One LA Times article was defaced for 45 minutes. <laughs> what was that? Uh, and, and he was convicted um, for CFAA violations under, I believe, the uh, password sharing or password trafficking provision. I don't remember. It might have also been unauthorized access on an accomplice liability theory. Um, LA Times claimed, and the DOJ went with, something like $900,000 in loss. Um, that, and, and that led to whatever it was, five, 60 months in jail, um, 60 month sentence recommendation. Uh, for Matthew Keyes. Um, that's two years? Four two years? years? You got two years. Two years. Um, that's absurd, right? Why, why would it be that someone who defaces a single 
a web page, a single article for 45 minutes gets two years when someone who spray painted a massive sign on the, sa on the LA Times building would get community service. Right. Sir, can I interject for a second? We're, uh, we're at time, 1225, but because we're up against the, your non-conflict lunchtime, you're welcome to stay. I think believe our panelists would like to continue to engage, so I just wanted to call official time if anybody's hungry. Thank you. <laughs> and no, no insult if you have to work. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so but please, before everyone leaves, can we give a big round of applause? Uh, Leonard Bailey, Todd Beardsley, Nate Cordoza, Jen Ellis, Kristen Goodwin. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so feel, feel free to leave or stay and... Uh, whatever. And uh, with, with all due respect, my friend Nate, um, the, on, on, on the Keys matter again, it's, it's been sentenced. I believe there'll be an appeal. I, I guess I, I actually don't, I can't speak to whether there was a $900,000 figure. I, I can say that in terms of characterizing it, um, there was a sense that essentially this is akin to, it was akin to um, uh, giving someone who you know is an arsonist the keys to your neighbor's house and saying, essentially, what he said, which go was, nuts, go nuts, right. Now, the fact that they had taken precautions to prevent Anonymous from going nuts on the website uh, may have been the difference between much grander damage and what, in fact, happened. But that's not because of Matthew's key, Matthew Keyes' culpability or lack thereof. But, but I bring it up specifically for the $900,000 loss calculation. One, one article's defacement for 45 minutes is not $900,000. I don't care how you count it. I don't know if you look at the Mutari case, I, 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 I don't know. against someone that, that caused 300 million reports of a, of a particular malware uh, hack in month. So we brought, we brought suit against that individual, and uh, we saw $200,000 in uh, our own damages, about, uh, I think it was about 500000 in uh, loss of goodwill and, and harm to Microsoft, and we sought a permanent injunction against the, the uh, guy who's behind the malware. So we, we won on the permanent injunction, and the total amount of damages granted to us in the civil court was 75000 So, you know, it, it can cut both ways. There's an egregious example, but then there's a simple example where we went for what we thought was the total value, and it came back much, much lower. So, you know, it, it's hard to get wrapped around the, the examples of, of particular cases because they, they cut all ways, but I think the underlying point is that we don't yet have clear parameters for what constitutes the actions of researchers vis-a-vis -vis crime. And we continue to look at cybercrime as that paradigm of, of criminality where we're going after individuals who are trying to make millions of dollars uh, uh, attacking our customers and stealing their, their creds and cleaning up their bank accounts versus a researcher who's looking at ball and hopefully reporting it to us. It's just a different paradigm, and the CFAA is probably not the right one. And so what can we do about that as a community? I have a question about bug bounties and it's on. Uh, researchers. Yeah, it's working. The Talk into it. Is this actually on? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> um, so there was recently the issue with the Facebook Instagram thing where a researcher found credit or found credentials, logged into an AWS account, used those credentials to pivot and discover some other vulnerabilities. Um, and so my question, it really is, what does the DOJ think about researchers exceeding bug bounty um, sort of boundaries? You know, you have an initial authorization, and it can be very fuzzy about where that authorization ends. Right. Can so you repeat the question? I believe the question is, so what, what does the Department of Justice think about bug bounties and in an instance where someone perhaps exceeds the, the terms of, of the bug and bounty? And what is exceeding the yeah, terms? Right. So uh, let me first say that we tend to like coordinated disclosure policies, in part because it's exactly what the CFA is intended to avoid. That is, instances where people are doing things that might be not desired by this network owner and thereby might obtain information they don't want released or do damage to a network. So we like having coordinated disclosure policies. We like bug bounties. Um, and we want those bounties to be well-crafted and clear so that there's no ambiguity. If one does exceed the terms of a bug bounty program, we would say yes. You have now. You are now outside of your authorization, which is why we would suggest you ask permission rather than seek forgiveness later in the context of a bug bounty program. Um, ideally, those programs again are graph crafted 
clearly enough that that's possible. I'll be interested to hear whether you think that is not, by and large, the case. From a civil perspective, you have to also think about the fact that when you're, when you're agreeing to participate in the bug bounty, it's a, on some levels, it's a contract. So there's, there's the civil side and the criminal side. Would the, would the, the, uh, would the civil entity that you're working with refer that to law enforcement as a criminal act? Yeah, I mean, massive kudos to Stamos for not referring that out. I mean, I think they even paid the guy, the Instagram guy. They just, they threw it, they threw a hissy fit and told him not to publish what he ended up actually publishing. Um, but they paid him out and they didn't refer him. So kudos. And for what it's worth, you may hear more about, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, you'll never get uh, there will be a, uh, as you know, the hack the Pentagon um, program that uh, was successfully ended. I think there is a briefing of the results there. And you'll hear things about that that I think will be heartening in terms of the way DOD certainly looked at how that program would be run and, and what was within scope and what they did about anything that was outside the of scope. beautiful lady in the purple hair can tell you all about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's really very good. Hey, um, hi. This, this is on? Yeah. Uh, um, I guess we all know the story of, uh, you know, Bill Gates at age 15 uh, hacking into DEC servers from across the country and causing some kind of system problems. I don't know if it was a crash or just issues. Uh, it was a pain in the ass for DEC, uh, but I think they kind of admired the fact that it was a 15-year-old kid who did it. Uh, and you know, a few years later, uh, you know, Steve Jobs and, and, and Steve Wozniak were going around selling blue boxes at the dorms at Cal. Uh, you know, how much would those guys get prosecuted under the CFAA? How much time would they do? And how much, frankly, is that? You know, this this new how much is a sort of vagueness of the statute suppressing people who would otherwise sort of like you know discover things in their youth and go on to do great and wonderful things? Just from talking to Metasploit contributors and talking to people who want to disclose vulnerabilities and really kind of don't know how. I mean, it's, it's the, like I said, I mean, the ambiguity is, is kind of the core of it, right? Like, if you have to tr just trust that, like, prosecutors are not going to go after you, um, that's a little bit hard. It's, a, it's gotten a lot easier in the last couple of years to make that case. Um, but to also trust that a company's general counsel is not going to go after you either. That that that's a harder sell, right? Um, because you don't because there there are lots and lots and lots of them, and they have all kind of different cultures. I would have no problem at all with reporting to bugs Microsoft on the daily, right? Like I don't have any issue with that. Um, they learn their lesson the hard way. Like I think you have to learn that lesson the hard way. What about um, Oracle, Todd? But what about Oracle? <laughs> uh, yeah, disclosing to a company. Like schmoracle, <laughs> um, that that's a little more fraught, right? Um, and and really, when it comes down to it, a lot of the bugs that I deal with are in they lately they've been like in IoT things and in um, you know other like devices that you don't that don't look like computers with keyboards or have servers or things like that. And those companies are learning now like how to do it. It's like it's like dealing with Microsoft circa 1999, and it's in in that it's very painful and horrible. Um, and um, I get I get a lot more angry letters from attorneys from small companies on small firm letterhead. Yep, that's <laughs> than, absolutely right. Than I do like from you know. Office of the General Counsel from you know a, a very a real giant company right like I don't I don't tend to see those anymore and I actually haven't seen any from Oracle in a long time either so I, I'd also just toss out for what it's worth I'm not sure that we we aren't in some ways thinking of the halcyon days of yore when when phone freakers could do whatever they want yeah when we, we do. when we think about like no 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 but but I, I, my point only being actually they got in trouble too. Um, John Draper, you know, Captain Crunch, um, ended up in, 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 in actually some trouble. Uh, there's a book, oh God, what was the? Exploding the Phone. Exploding the Phone, thank you. It goes back to kind of chronicle the history of phone freakers. And a lot of these folks did get knocks on their door from AT&T. Um, I think one of the differences, it was a little harder to track them back then in telephony than it is today. With, so it, it may not be day and night between what happened before. That said, 
uh, we've heard the concern about like our innovators being you know tamped down because they're afraid to play, <coughs> and that's where we're trying to figure out how we can talk about the CFAA in a way that at least helps people, even if we don't have legislation passed, discern between what is okay behavior and things that actually will likely end in some sort of prosecution is kind of important. But this is where the, the DOJ, DHS, and, and Commerce, and we, can, we can use the institutions of U.S. government to, to help get model disclosure, vulnerability disclosure policies, model bug bounty policies. So mm -hmm. We can start to go to the, the smaller companies and the, the medium-sized companies to, to, to get it some of these issues as a bridging tactic. But, you know, I, I keep thinking about how is the CFAA going to work in 10 years' time when one of you figures out a machine-to-machine, -machine, you know, using machine learning, where you're going to have a machine that's not even directed by a human. It's going to exceed its authorized access, and you're not going to be connected to it at all. You know, the, the CFAA is not designed to think about uh, some of those scenarios. And so how are we going to evolve that law? Well, we have to get the base policies out, vulnerable disclosure, bug bounties, reporting, mitigation, uh, and, and make sure that those become much more commonplace and much more norm. Because I think you know what we hear about in the bones that come in to us too, or from smaller people that don't know where to send them, so we, we help with that. But um, how do we then solve for the CFAA problem? That, that's the, the 10 year down the road issue. Okay, so we're giving we're giving the giant crook to get out of the room. Um, are there any burning questions before we get out of here? <clears throat> One small one regarding the password uh, sharing part of the CFAA. Um, like I know what, there's very often password dumps online where a, a database is hacked, username, password hashes are dumped. Um, I know there's a bit of a uh, contentious area regarding trafficking passwords online. My perspective as a security researcher and slash, you know, pen, uh, commercial pen tester is uh, if there is a commercial dump of passwords, I have to assume every bad actor out there has those passwords. As a, as a job-related issue, I need to get, acquire my own copy of those, that password uh, database dump so I can then test against a target website I'm um, hired to go after, you know, are they still using the same credentials or the same username and the same password as this hacked database? Uh, I mean, is there an issue with uh, commercial pen testers doing that? So 1030A6, I would just point to the words with intent to defraud. So that's required for there to be a criminal violation of, of the password trafficking statute. So what you described there does not sound like with intent to defraud. Sure. Authorization. Yeah, I mean, just factually, yeah. So I, <laughs> I think that's I damage to a computer. I think it's a CFAA it. violation. Yeah. Yes. If, if that mic is Wi-Fi, that's CFAA. <laughs> I have a final question for the panelists. So, um, a quick show of hands from you guys on who believes that the CFAA should be reformed to protect security researchers. What do you mean by reform? <laughs> I don't know. It depends. I have to be the And and quick show of hands, who believes that CFA reform is a realistic possibility in the next three years? Three years? Three years. <laughs> I'm an optimist. Yeah. <laughs> Take the elections. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> Counselor? <laughs> You know what would help is if we have Microsoft support. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>